website at www.woca.com. Ocala's Information Station, 1370 WOCA. Ocala! Twenty-five minutes before eleven o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. This uh, it's raining a little bit this Monday morning. Uh, have you ever played chess, Robin? Are you a chess player at all? Yes, I like chess. Right, where's your voice? The, I enjoy chess. You, are you good at it? Not that good. I'm no. horrible at it. No, I'm, horrible I'm, at it. I'm not good at it, but I do like to play. But, but those people who I know who are good at it will tell like you. Like your nephew. Yes. Yeah, oh, yes. Jim. I he's have, incredible. I, right, right. He's amazing. And so the, they will say, and I don't know if he's ever told me this, but it's a way to kind of exercise your brain so that you're always thinking two steps ahead or more than that of any opponent, you know, like in the in the, in the real world, like in sales mm-hmm. or like if you're going to conquer the world or whatever, or, or protect yourself, I don't know. But it's a, it's a way of thinking ahead. That's what, that's what it trains you to do. Mm-hmm. Um, our next story has to do with chess, but it's got way more than that, and I will let our guest talk to you about it um she is Catherine neville i know that a lot of you are already fans of Catherine neville because you've called in uh she has a new book it's called the eight she is not only a best-selling author but a, an historian she uh the eight is considered an historical thriller novel a feminist answer to raiders of the lost ark it's kind of funny uh charlemagne king of the franks who laid the foundations for modern france and germany and there's a chess game in here as well. Catherine Neville. Good morning, Catherine. Hi. How are you? Where are you? I am in Virginia uh, looking out of my Japanese house at a whole bunch of birds flying around. Oh, wow. oh a Japanese oh, wow. house. That is cool. You're, you're a busy lady. I, I looked you up. You've been writing forever, haven't you? Yeah, I've actually, this is the, I think, 25th anniversary of the eight. And it's just gone into, that was my first book that was published, and it's just gone into ebooks for the first time ever. Um, so I'm totally, I just sort of got thrown into the 21st century. <laughs> I'd never done Facebook or any of these things, and it's really fun. It's fun. I mean, there are whole, there's a whole like, generation of readers out there who um, only have read ebooks. <laughs> yeah, and it took me a while to warm up to them. I, I became a fan of ebooks as well. Um, but are you a computer specialist? Am I understanding this right? I was, yeah, many, many years ago. I designed computers for mostly in the energy field. And that's the whole plot of the eight is that it takes place, well, as you said, it takes place uh, during the French Revolution in the chest out of Charlemagne and all that. But uh, the modern part of the book, it goes back and forth, takes place in it goes from the 1790s to the 1970s and the 1970s was during the OPEC embargo um, on oil all over the world and I happened to be automating part of the Algerian government uh, when the OPEC embargo took place so I was I was living in North Africa and my one of my clients the big oil conglomerate Sonatrack was part of the um, Part of the oil embargo. Oh, really? So I have characters in the book running all over the place uh, for 200 years trying to find the pieces of this fabulous gold and silver bejeweled chess set that got scattered, gets scattered all over the planet. Okay, so help um, us understand anyway. Help us understand that. I, I, so far, I'm, I'm confused, and if, if I am, that means probably nobody else is. But, but it, it, <laughs> <laughs> so the, the chess set is magical in, somehow, in some way? Yeah, it's about this fabulous chess set that's been buried for a thousand years, and at the beginning of the book, it's the dawn of the French Revolution, and these soldiers are looting all the abbeys and monasteries, so these nuns scatter the chess pieces and the board all over the planet. And for 200 years, everybody's trying to put the pieces back together because the chess set, when reassembled, contains a secret of dark, mysterious power. (laughs) That is pretty intriguing. Yeah, it's really fun, and it's like one, I would say, one of the world's most bizarre 
uh, complicated caper novels. You know, it's like everyone's... And it, it was given credit uh, when when the sequel came out. The sequel was called The Fire, and it came out a few years ago. Um, when the sequel came out, people were crediting the age with having paved the way for books like The Da Vinci Code and, you know, that whole um, new genre that's uh, called the quest novel that's actually the oldest genre in the world. <laughs> so, okay, but, and, uh, and is, it, is yeah. it taking historical fact and, and intertwining some more colorful stories that, that might make it more exciting to, to learn about? Yeah, the thing is, um, all the historic characters, except uh, two or three, are real historic figures, and like Catherine the Great and Napoleon. I even have um, Napoleon's mother in, in the book, and and his sister, and Napoleon's grandmother, Angela Maria di Pietra Santa, who could raise from her own army of cousins and brothers a, an army to fight the Vendetta Traversa. <laughs> she was wow. she was like a little. A little Corsican mafiosa, Napoleon's grandmother. Huh. So, um, the, on the cover of the book, uh, it's it's a sideways aid. Is that to the uh, infinity symbol? Is there a, a, a symbolism there? Yes, yes. That was my um, that was my original publisher, um, my original editor in chief's idea was to put an infinity symbol on it that looks like a Mobius strip. You know, a Mobius strip is where you take a piece of paper and, you know, children learn to do this where you twist it once and then you attach the ends. So right. that if you were an ant, you could walk around the bottom and the top at the same time. And so um, he wanted to put a Mobius strip on, on the front of the book. And he said, um, well, I think it has a lot to do, the book has a lot to do with mathematics and puzzles. And I said, um, the whole book is a Mobius strip. <laughs> the plot of the book is like, you, you go from the historic part to the modern part, and the modern characters, we the readers know what's going on in the historic part, but the modern characters have to discover it. So it, it is like a giant puzzle. And the book, in fact, Itself, you don't, you know, you obviously don't have to play, know how to play chess to to read the book because it's fiction. Right, right. But the book itself actually is based on a real chess game that took place between two grandmasters in, in history, and um, it's it's sort of you sort of feel it like the chess masters have read the book. In fact, I I was doing a taping in New York City a couple of weeks ago in a um, place called the Chess Forum. Uh -huh. It's a chess shop, and they have chess games there. And um, some people walked in, and one of them was the Nigerian national chess champion, uh, whose name I cannot pronounce. And the uh -huh. other one was his trainer, and they were there for the world uh, trials for, you know, for a world chess competition. And they said, um, who is that lady who's being interviewed? And they said, oh, she's an author. She wrote a book called The Eight. And they went, Oh my gosh! <laughs> so a lot of the chess so did you have to? Uh, are you a chess player? I'm a terrible chess player. I have actually something um, called chess blindness, where you sort of feel like Alice in the rabbit hole. You don't actually see the whole board, and um, but that made me very fascinated by chess because I thought it was such a fun game. And so, but you must the eight. for you to have for you to have impressed them. You must have, you must grasp it anyway, even if you don't play it well, as you oh, say. Yeah, yeah. They, they love the book because it it has to do with the sort of cosmic aspects of chess. You know how it's sort of an archetypal huge image um, that, and it's fun to have a book based on a game. You know, it's. Yeah, uh, yeah, even yeah. though the game is a little cerebral for a lot of people, I, you know, a lot of my readers, even when the book first came out, and it was considered very complicated 25 years ago, um, but now, of course, we have one woman who's written seven 700 page books that 10 year old children can read. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Harry right, Potter. Right, right, right. And uh, I think, um, I think that the younger people got it faster than people of our generation. Really? That's a, um, that is interesting. Yeah, young, tw I got letters from 10-year-olds and 12-year-olds, and a lot of them started playing chess when they read the book. My goodness. We, it was sounded 
Catherine, glamorous and exciting. We need to take a little break, but we'll be right back. This is fascinating. We'll be right back with Catherine Neville. The weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accident. For today, more clouds and sun, along with a couple of thunderstorms, mainly during the afternoon hours over the interior, the high today, 90 to 94, and partly cloudy tonight with a shower and thunderstorm around, low 73 to 77. For tomorrow, partly sunny with a thunderstorm popping up in the afternoon, high 91 to 95. For Wednesday, sun and some clouds with a couple of afternoon thunderstorms, high 90 to 94. From the Florida Weather Center, the meteorologist Joe Bunbury. Are you wasting hundreds or thousands of dollars on termite retreat fees? If you're not with Turner Pest Control, you probably are. Turner Pest Control offers the industry's only termite and pest control package that never charges retreat fees, ever. You can get started today for only $99. This is a value of $500 or more. This includes treatments, installation of monitoring stations, quarterly pest control, and a lifetime guarantee, all for an unbelievable low $99. Even if you have another pest control provider, visit turnerpest.com to find out how you can avoid paying those high termite retreat fees. Career Source Citrus Levy Marion brings together business and community partners, economic development leaders, and educational providers to connect employers with qualified, skilled talent, and job seekers with employment and career development opportunities. Tune in the first and third Wednesday of each month at 9:30 a.m. to Career Source Citrus Levy Marion and learn how they can help you. If you're anything like I was, the thought of getting older was the last thing on your mind. But here we are. For me, it started slowly. The lack of energy. Never being in the mood. And when I was, I could never perform at my best. I tried the pills and other treatments with minimal results and all but given up on my sex life. Then I found the doctors at New Mail Medical Center. Wow, they made a new male out of me. Feel like I'm 25 again. I have renewed vigor, so much more energy, and no longer worry about my performance. New Mail treated me like my situation was one of a kind. With a custom treatment plan that really works, I feel great. They can create one for you too. It does not matter if you suffer from low testosterone, erectile dysfunction, or just want to last longer. New Mail will help you. Call New Mail Medical Center today at 352-404-4779. 352-404-4779. That's 352-404-4779. It will change your life. 352-404-4779. All right, uh, 12 minutes before 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Catherine Neville is on the phone in Virginia, and her book, I, I uh, forgive me for not knowing this, this is a book that's been around a while. It's The Eight, and uh, if you have a, an electronic reading device like a Kindle or just Nook still around, is Nook still around today? Did that no, disappear? Nook is still, uh, Nook is still around. Yeah. My daughter in law has both. Uh, anyway, so th- so this is the reintroduction of a, of a classic book that um, may not have been in the on the radar of younger readers simply because it wasn't available as an ebook and now it is. Catherine Neville, does that does that explain kind of what you're doing today? Is is promoting it because it's being reintroduced? Well, yes. Um, this, what happened is that uh, I did not let any of my books go into ebook format because I wanted to be sure that when they went into ebook format that they would go into ebooks correctly so that people would, you know, that they could be read on any platform, that people would know how to get them easily. And so basically I held off for about five or six years of putting my books into ebooks and now all of them are being released as ebooks on all different platforms. Well, that that was very so, that was very smart. I don't know if that was calculated or or just an accident, but but I remember in the beginning of ebooks, you would get a book sometimes and it wouldn't it would it would cut off. You couldn't get the right edge of the page, for example. Um, and and I guess no, they've worked out all the bugs. Is, yeah, with my books, it's really important. I mean, there are quotations at the beginning of each chapter. Those quotations are clues to things that are going to be happening in that chapter. <laughs> so I have a whole lot of um, sort of interwoven things, and I know that even though as readers we try not to be angry with the author if something's wrong with the author's book, but still you, you can't help but resent it a little bit if, if there's something wrong with the printing or the this or the that. You right. sort of hold the author responsible. And I, I really feel about my books almost like the way people would feel about their children, you know, that you you don't just sort of 
throw them out in the world and say, let the publisher take care of them. (laughs) (laughs) You want to sort of, you know, you want to sort of um, present them so that in such a way that people can enjoy them without having to work at it. Um, So it was really important to me as a, as a former computer person, in fact, uh, a former electronic industry person to, to be sure that, that um, I used to say to my publishers, you know, the thing is, if if um, if you were uh, doing a, doing a user manual for a, a nuclear reactor, you would want to be sure that it was really easy for people to read and that they would enjoy reading it <laughs> and understand it. <laughs> I think so uh, the same thing with a novel. I think uh, uh, Charlemagne is an, an uh, extremely interesting historical figure, and the people in the West aren't as familiar with him as the people over in 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 the east were so you're really making it more intriguing for people to do more research on him on their own i'm really i you know i'm really glad you mentioned him specifically um the uh the sequel to the eight which is called the fire um is also going into ebook and that that um the, the entire m- mystery behind the chess set, the chess set was given to Charlemagne in my novel. Uh, there, there was no real chess set. I invented the chess set. But uh, the chess set was given to Charlemagne in the novel by the Moorish governor of Barcelona, Spain. And the, Moorish, the Moors ran Spain for six or 700 years. So all of that history is part of the book because it's part of the history of the chess set. And people are always trying to find out what power this chess set has over, uh, it, it's, it says in the book that it has the power to, to create or destroy civilizations. So uh, Char- at the very beginning of the book, we see Charlemagne, we hear the story about Charlemagne um, having a, um, being almost possessed by this chess set and being not in control of himself. And so the very beginning of the book, we know that there is this potential for, the question that myself in every book that I write is the question that I try to have readers try to answer uh, and think about. And so the question in the eight that I asked before writing the book was, what should be done with scientific knowledge that could either be powerful uh, beneficial or dangerous to mankind, and each character in the book comes up with a different <laughs> answer to that question. And I, I learned that the readers did too. Readers would write me letters and say, "Well, I think they made the wrong decision. <laughs> I would have done this with." Oh, the really? Pieces. Really? It was like so. Uh, so, you know, what should be done with the chess pieces? So, the chess pieces. Do they, do, does each piece have a special kind of power? that when they come together they, they, they form the ultimate power or and is it a metaphor for something else? Right, right. it's exactly what you said it's uh, when all the pieces are assembled there's this mysterious power no one knows exactly what it is but everyone interested in the nature of power is after these pieces and trying to assemble them and there are two teams there's a black team and a white team and this goes on for 200 years as I said back and forth in the book so it's it's really it's really really a, a colorful romp through history that has a lot to do with the kind of players that were interested in power but um, is it one is time I yeah, sorry. Well, I was just going to ask, is it a metaphor for for power? I mean, it, like, like if somebody wants to be in power, they have to be, they have to have all the pieces. Uh, I don't know if there's as many pieces as there are in a chess set, but you you would need the support of the people, I guess. You would need, I don't, I don't know what the pieces would be, but I, I guess the question is, is this a metaphor for something, something more profound? Yeah, and actually all of the characters in the book are, as we start to realize our pieces in this chess game that's taking place over 200 years, each one of them has a sort of role to play in the game. Oh, really? And, uh, yeah, and so there is a, uh, we we start to, I don't, uh, we don't decipher all of them, but our heroine, for instance, is escorted uh, as a pawn, is escorted down the board basically by two characters who later are symbolized as a knight and a, and a castle. 
and uh, you know protect her and do c- carry out various um, uh, exercises. But I'm I'm giving away too much. <laughs> <laughs> it's a five. Yeah, it's, so this is a five hundred page book. This is five. This is a big book, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's 500 pages. But, you know, that's what I was saying before. It's really great to have a whole new crop of young people who grew up with books like Harry Potter because when The Eight came out, people thought that young people couldn't read books that were longer than 50 or 60 pages. And not only are they able to read them, they're able to retain what they read. It's a real educational process. And that was the thing that I loved about The Eight, that I would get these letters from young people and they would even send me photographs of themselves like a, a bunch of young girl students in the Galapagos Islands doing research <laughs> would send me a picture of them in their bunks reading the aid and uh, I, I think I, I need to put all those images on my website because it's it's been a book that has the letters that I receive most often are people saying this is my favorite book that I've ever read in my life and I've read it 16 times, 17 times, 27 times, <laughs> and every year I go and read it, and, and it makes you feel wonderful for having um, produced something that that people enjoy so much. I think the reason for that really is that it, people get engaged and that they feel that they're inside the book, walking around inside the book. So does it does it lead to pressure from the pu- uh, publishers to, to create oh. another one? Oh, Gosh, or a similar you know. one? <laughs> <laughs> authors can never authors can never listen to their publisher. <laughs> you, know you have to write what you what you want to write, what you need to write. You really have to write what. When I started writing, I wanted the reason I wanted to be a writer is that there were no books anymore being written of the kind of books I love to read. I love to read swashbuckling adventure novels. And in school, all we ever got were, you know, like boring life in the suburbs, John Updike, or, you know, woman sitting alone in a room, Virginia Woolf. <clears throat> and mm-hmm. I wanted to be out climbing trees or, you know, being a pirate or something. <laughs> 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 and so I read all the, I read all the, like, Raphael Sabatini pirate books, Captain Blood, The Seahawk. And I read all the Alexander Dumas books. And um, uh, I said, uh, if I can't find any more books like that, then I'll just write them myself. So I started writing these (laughs) um, really thrilling, I consider them adventure novels. Um, I mean, they are thrilling, so technically, and I am one of the the 32 original founders of International Thriller Writers. (laughs) Oh, nice. I'm not saying they're not thrillers. Congratulations. But, uh, oh, we... Oh, thank you. We, you know, that is um, one of the most interesting organizations and has grown faster than any um, author organization. And uh, now the the people who were um, running it actually no authors, no published authors even have to pay dues anymore because we we were so successful in the first um, couple of years. Um, we put out a bunch of interesting books like Thriller mm-hmm. where we contributed short stories but anyway so uh, yes I, I think part of the reason that we founded International Thriller Writers was to tell people how many different kinds of thrillers there were you know not just uh, legal thrillers or police thrillers or spy thrillers but in my case adventure quest novels you know where people are out um, having adventures and seeking some mysterious object or formula or you know mystery that um, they have to solve puzzles to be able to find. And um, okay, anyway, the, I love it, Catherine. The one <laughs> the one question that either it, it, I just uh, wasn't aware or what is eight? I mean, wh- wh- there there are more than eight pieces to a chess set. So what is eight? Well, there are eight pieces and eight pawns on each side of the chessboard. Oh, and okay. There are, and there are 64 uh, squares, and that's eight times eight. Okay, and then okay. in the day that the book takes place in the modern part, all computers were based on an octal system. They were all base eight um, oh my goodness. Uh, programming. And then at the beginning of the book, there uh, the heroine is working for, the modern heroine is working for a 
Wow. One of the big eight CPA firms. There are, there are eight large accounting firms. Before we run out of time, let me make sure we get the, the audience some information so they can get the book. It's, I found that on Amazon. I found that on Barnes & Noble. I found that everywhere. And it's available now as, a, as an e-book. So go get it. And CatherineNeville.com is your website. Catherine with a K, of course. Uh, Catherine, thank you so much. You're a delight to have on the air with us. Thank you, Larry and Robin. That's great. Thank you. All right, we'll take a little break and be right back. A mild panic, but like like 1987, it was nothing like that. It wasn't that sick feeling in your gut. Ongoing concerns over China's economy dragging down the markets. A Louisiana state trooper dies after being shot in the head. 43-year-old trooper Stephen Vincent came under fire by a suspected drunk driver Sunday who's seen on dash cam pulling a sawed-off shotgun near Lake Charles in southwestern Louisiana. Good Samaritans stopped and tackled 54 54- year old Kevin Daigle. Fox Radio's Jeff Manasso. The Mer-